Good evening, I'm Rachel Floor, Executive Director of the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. On behalf of my library and foundation colleagues, I'm delighted to welcome all of you who are watching tonight's program online. Thank you so much for joining us as we try to make sense of a wild few days that will surely go down in political history. I would also like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors, Bank of America and the Lowell Institute and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe and WBUR. We look forward to a robust question and answer period this evening. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comments on our YouTube page during the program. While we are all on the edge of our seats this year, 60 years ago, Senator John F. Kennedy and Vice President Richard Nixon faced off in one of the closest elections in the nation's history. In the popular vote, JFK's margin over Nixon was just about 118,000 out of a total of nearly 69 million votes cast, though he received a clear majority of 303 to 219 in the electoral vote. If you need an escape from our extended Election Day 2020, or what I think we can start calling Election Week 2020, I invite you to check out the latest episode of our 6020 podcast, which brings you back to Election Day 1960, including the story of Nixon's trip to Tijuana, Mexico for lunch after he voted. While our democracy churns away as we speak, we are so grateful to have this opportunity to explore these extraordinary elections with our distinguished guests this evening. I'm so pleased to extend a warm welcome back to the library to Dan Baltz, chief correspondent at the Washington Post. He joined the paper in 1978 and has been involved in the Post's political coverage as an award-winning reporter or editor throughout his career. Before joining the Post, he worked at National Journal Magazine as a reporter and an editor and at the Philadelphia Inquirer. He is the author of several books, including two bestsellers. He is also a regular panelist on PBS's Washington Week and is a frequent guest on the Sunday morning talk shows and other public affairs programs. Welcome back as well to Jonathan Capehart, who joins us today by phone. He's a public Pulitzer Prize winning journalist who's a member of the Washington Post editorial board, writes about pol politics and social issues and hosts the Cape Up podcast. He's an MSNBC contributor who regularly serves as a substitute anchor. Prior to the Post, he was deputy ed editorial editor of the New York Daily News and served on that paper's editorial board. He left the Daily News to become the national affairs columnist at Bloomberg News and took a leave from that position to serve as a policy advisor to Michael Bloomberg in his first successful campaign for New York City mayor. A warm welcome also to Maria Hinojosa, whose nearly 30 year career as a journalist includes reporting for PBS, CBS, WGBH, WNBC, CNN, NPR, and anchoring and executive pro producing the Peabody Award winning show Latino USA, distributed by NPR. She is a frequent guest on MSNBC and has won numerous awards, including four Emmys. In 2010, she founded Futuro Media, an independent nonprofit organization with the mission of producing multimedia content from a person of color's perspective. She is the founding co-anchor of the political podcast In the Thick and the author most recently of Once I Was You, a memoir of love and hate in a torn America. I am also delighted to welcome Alice Stewart, CNN political commentator, fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School's Institute of Politics, veteran senior communica communications advisor on numerous presidential campaigns, and an Emmy Award winning journalist. She is also a contributor on National Public Radio and serves at, on the faculty at the Leadership Institute where she conducts media training for political leaders in the United States and abroad. She has worked as a communications director for the presidential campaigns of Senator Ted Cruz, Governor Mike Huckabee, Senator Rick Santorum, and Congresswoman Michelle Bachman, and has served as a surrogate for the National Republican Committee. And finally, I'm so pleased to welcome Evan Thomas, our moderator for this evening's discussion, back to the library virtually. He is the best-selling author of 10 books. He was a writer, correspondent, and editor for 33 years at Time and Newsweek, including 10 years as Washington Bureau Chief at Newsweek, where at the time of his retirement, he was editor at large. He wrote more than 100 cover stories, including Newsweek's election specials in 1996, 2000, and 2004, and in 1999, won a National Magazine Award. 
He has appeared on many TV and radio talk shows and has taught journalism and writing at Harvard and Princeton. Please join me in welcoming our special guests. Over to you, Evan. Thanks, Rachel. And welcome, everybody, at the Kennedy Library. Uh, so my first question is, who won? Dan, who won? <laughs> well, the, the cliche, Evan, that we always say is the American people won, but I'm not sure the American people would say that this week as they're having to sit and watch uh, endless changes in the map and endless updates from uh, a handful of states that are going to decide the election. Uh, the short answer is we don't know yet. Um, former Vice President Biden looks to be in a stronger position than President Trump, but there's still a route, a very narrow one for President Trump, and uh, we are going to see within probably the next 36 hours how this comes out. Uh, Alice, who won? Uh, I will sort of agree with Dan and that we will, um, it's, it's been a changing narrative. It's kind of like uh, Jell-O, right? Uh, it started out, um, the victory was for democracy. We had record number of people coming out and it was awe inspiring to see the, um, interest and the lines and the the people really wanting to make their voices heard um, and then to have such a overwhelming uh, early vote turnout and then certainly on election day was a great sign for democracy i will have to say i am uh, disheartened for anyone to question the integrity of the election and the outcome uh, i think every vote should be counted i had a um, call with some of my Harvard students earlier, and this was the first time they ever voted. And this was their first opportunity to to go vote for a president and to, to see people um, say stop the vote. Uh, it sends a, a really bad message. But uh, I, in terms of who's going to come out on, on top, um, I, I would have to say it's going to be down to the wire, down to the you know thousands of votes. But um, it looks as though uh, Joe Biden has the Electoral College map in his favor this time, and I, I expect to see him with getting the first to 270, without a doubt, uh, in the next week or so. But uh, it will certainly go with legal challenges. Uh, the same question for the next two pa pa panelists, uh, Jonathan. Uh, who won? You could you could answer as broadly as the others, not just which candidate <laughs> yeah. did the system win. Um, I I agree with Dan and with Alice, and in fact, I was going to say what Alice said, and that is truly the American people won. Um, like Alice, I was inspired to see just how many people um, participated in early voting, whether putting their ballots in drop boxes, um, sending in absentee ballots, um, and certainly the long lines that we saw um, in states all over the country, people exercising their right to vote in ways um, we haven't seen in, in recent memory. And then, of course, on Election Day. And, you know, usually every four years we bemoan the fact that the American people don't participate uh, as much as we'd like them to during, pres during elections, and particularly during presidential elections. And we're not bemoaning that now. We're bemoaning the fact that there's so many ballots that they can't be counted in time to, you know, um, uh, satiate everyone's thirst for immediate answers. So the American people won. Maria? So I, <clears throat> I, I have this image of my daughter who just graduated from Brown, sort of, because there wasn't a ceremony, um, you know, who's been cooped up and, and incredibly frustrated as I would be if I was just graduating from college and couldn't leave my home and in fact had to move in with my, with my parents. Her, her transformation over the time of the pandemic, always politically aware, but where she is now was doing math, staying up, coming in and checking, obsessed with particular states. So she's a symbol of who won for me which is that there is a generation which will be forever changed by this moment in history. They will never see an American election in the same way. And the sense of the American people winning, I would say it's because the wool has been taken off of our eyes. We now understand, oh, so this is what voter suppression looks like. Wait, why is it that we have to wait in all of these long lines? Wait, what is the Electoral College really all about? 
what is that? There's a whole conversation that is happening right now. Um, so, and I also think the other, you know, I'll, I'll be very kind of specific. I mean, if you look at my Instagram feed, the winners are Latina women. Um, there's a real sense that uh, Latina women voters came out. Yes, you're talking about states where there are smaller numbers like Wisconsin. But when you're talking about such small numbers, if 30,000 Latinas came out and voted uh, blue um, and they came and they voted early, like we're seeing, you know, 300 percent increase in terms of Latinos and Latinas turning out for early, early voting. This bodes really well for the future of democracy in our country. Why? Because Latinos and Latinas are the second largest voting bloc in the entire United States. So if democracy is looking good for Latinos and Latinas, it's looking good for the future of democracy in this country. So this is basically a pretty upbeat view from all four of you that, you know, we had a we had a we had an election that it wasn't violent. Uh, I feel that. But let me just make sure that we're not missing something here. Is there still a potential for either violence or a court challenge? We should get into the court challenge, but let's let's start with violence. Does anybody worry that there still could be violence, that this could somehow go south on us? I do. Are you, are you I, I do. I, I, I actually, you know, I've been doing um, a lot of live radio and kind of getting calls and such. I think that there is a, a concern. I, I, I will tell you that I have had moments today, for example, where I'm just like, OK, I remember the year 2000. I was covering that election. I remember four years ago what was going on. So I, um, I do worry. Um, and I think that in that sense, this is a really deep test. Um, I will tell you, I, that slim chance of a possibility of Donald Trump winning is something that feels very real for me. Um, and so I don't, I don't discard it. Um, and I think that the, a, a notion of kind of, I mean, I think you're right. We were very upbeat because, you know, we're political journalists. I mean, gosh, I mean, give us a chance to say something good happened, you know, <laughs> but, but I think that all of us understand that there is, we are living in a very precarious time in this country because of the fact that there are, there's an instigating factor to try to get it to go south, as you said. Is there, let's turn for one second to the to the uh, the legal side of this without getting too much into the weeds. Uh, Alice, maybe you can address this. Is there a does assuming that President Trump loses on the numbers, is there a legal path for him to challenge this that would get to the Supremes and actually reverse uh, reverse the outcome? If you ask Rudy Giuliani, uh, the answer is unequivocally yes. Um, but whether or not that's going to change the outcome, uh, I, I seriously doubt that. And I'll say this, the Trump campaign is adamant that this election is being stolen by the Democrats. Uh, one of the other um, jobs I've done in the past, I was Deputy Secretary of State in Arkansas. So I can call you know, Secretaries of State and, and ask them questions. I've done so in the last few days. And they all assure me, we all know we're all very smart people. These elections are run state by state. Each state um, elections director and the secretary of state takes great pride in, in ensuring the integrity of their election and making sure that people's votes are cast, they are secured, and they are counted. And that is something that they all uh, really work hard to do. And I have no doubt that there might be some instances of, of isolated, um, questionable ballots, but to to legally challenge an entire state and successfully overturn the will of the state. I think that's a really difficult battle. Uh, more than likely, if they want to do recounts and count ballot by ballot like we did in 2000, uh, that may possibly change things. But in, but in the end, just based on the numbers that we're seeing and the, the efforts and the links to which these election officials realize they're under the microscope, um, I, I don't see any... Uh, unscrupulous behavior going on that would ultimately change the outcome. Jonathan, do you do you see anything that could go go wrong here, so to speak, that either either a legal challenge that could throw it into the Supreme Court or maybe even ultimately, I suppose, Congress or or violence? Or do you see any do you think this do you think this process is going to get done in a peaceful way with 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 Biden winning in a few days? Um, I, 
I do. And, and, and I hope it's not because I'm a, a hopeless optimist. You know, I am, as we're doing this, I'm also seeing on Twitter that there's, you know, demonstrations happening in Arizona um, uh, with people chanting, you know, stop the steal. Um, you would hope that uh, the president of the United States or leaders in the country would step forward and, and try to cool the passion. Um, but that's not happening from the the incumbent president of the United States. Um, I don't, just given what we've seen with um, the, the court challenges leading up to election, the actual election day, and how judges across the country have smacked back efforts, um, I'd be hard pressed to see a case coming forward that would bubble its way up to the Supreme Court uh, to get them involved, but I'm not a lawyer and, you know, the Supreme Court got involved in 2000, but I just have to think that things have gotten, have, have uh, gotten so far in the process that any case challenging the results of the election um, will, will be laughed out of court. But until, but until this thing is signed, sealed, and delivered, certified, um, I will not feel comfortable that we have a resolution to the election, although I am very hopeful that we will. Dan, do you see any wrinkles here that could? Well, I think, everybody, I, Evan, I think everybody does worry uh, because of what we have seen in the run-up to the election. Um, sporadic, you know, sporadic signs of uh, demonstrations of unruly behavior. Um, and I think that one of the very hopeful signs is how relatively peaceful this week has been. Um, yes, there are some demonstrations outside of some of the counting centers, but, but nothing has gotten out of hand. Everybody seems to be in control of it. Um, and so, so far, so good. I think a lot depends on what happens when we get a, you know, when we get an outcome, when we get a declared president elect um, and if, if that happens to be Vice President Biden, how President Trump responds to that. Um, his, his tweets this week have been, you know, uh, you know, typically incendiary that the election is being stolen, but the campaign has not yet been able to produce any real evidence of that. We're not at a point where any state is in the neighborhood of the kind of thing we saw in Florida in 2000, where the vote is so close uh, that it requires uh, it requires a recount and a recount that could change the outcome of the election. I mean, there, there are recounts in many kinds of elections, uh, but in a presidential election, uh, it has to be a recount that would actually change the, the, the electoral college math. So far, we're not at that point. So I, I think I, I, I would say I am, I am hopeful, but I think that this is, you know, this is clearly a divided country. And the passions that exist on both sides are quite intense, as we know. Um, if anything, the election results to date have reinforced the degree to which we're two Americas. Um, and how that unfolds over the next you know, few days and then few months as we go between now and, and the inauguration uh, will be a, a continuing test for, you know, for our democracy and, and for, for people as a whole. But uh, right now, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll get through this okay. And Evan, if I can weigh in there real quick. Um, I'm not certain where everyone watching is based, but, you know, a lot of folks, if you're in D.C. or New York, a lot of these large towns have stores and businesses all boarded up. When I go to do CNN hits, all the businesses are boarded up, like ready for a hurricane. And it is some comfort um, to see that there's not any organized proactive rallies going on uh, in anticipation of one outcome or the other. But I do worry that what we potentially could have is those people that are going to the polling centers and encouraging to stop the vote or, or trying to be poll watchers that aren't authorized to do so. That's where I am fearful we could have um, tensions and emotions running high and, and opportunities for not necessarily organized protests, but just the overflow of emotions. Uh, that, and that's probably more of a concern than, than what we thought would potentially happen last week. And, you know, I, I would like to jump in in terms of um, something yeah. that 
Dan said in terms of, you know, or everybody really in terms of a divided country. I mean, I, you know, as somebody who was not born in this country and became a citizen in 1989, as we're talking, I'm just kind of trying to remember putting things into context, you know. I mean, I was a little girl when George Wallace was running for president. But even without cable news, Twitter, social media, whatever, I was six, seven years old, and I already knew that he didn't like Mexicans. So, the, and, and, and even me as a little girl, the daughter of a professor at the University of Chicago was ashamed of speaking Spanish. So when we talk about a, a divided country, I think about the fact that, you know, there's been a long history of this country having a problem with the other. Um, and, and we cannot escape the fact that Donald Trump, one of his incisive, you know, incision points is race. It is that. It is, you know, Mexicans, in fact. It is creating this, um, you know, the, the difference between us. So, I mean, am I uncomfortable about what the next uh, couple of days, I mean, I have a cottage in Connecticut that went red. It's the only it's the only county in Connecticut that went red. That's where we live. So I'm a little bit like, wow, yeah. Um, but the problem is, is that no one's going anywhere. So we've got mm -hmm. to figure this out. We've you know, we've got to somehow figure this out. And I think that's what we're trying to do is, you know, we need to continue to have these kinds of dialogues to bring clarity. And now we have so much work to do to clear up the obfuscation and the lies that we've been living through. This is uh, always dangerous to speculate about President Trump, but what do you think he's going to do? What's he going to do? Is he, is he going to go? Is he going to accept it? Is he going to incite violence? Does anybody want to hazard? A I, I do have I do have an idea. I, I actually think that um, um, Marielle Trump kind of expanded on this idea. Marielle Trump said that given and if you've read her book, which is fascinating, she said, you know, he's going to end up saying, well, who wants to be president of the United States anyway? I mean, your country, this country is so, you know, who cares about? And I predict, I'm gonna go on the record, that Donald Trump leaves the United States. In fact, he already said it. He said, I may have to leave this place. And I'm gonna go out on a limb, but why not? I think that there's, um, I think that there's a, a, a triplex um, penthouse waiting for him in Moscow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. It's just that where is he? Where is he going to go? Where he can say, "And now I'm going to a place where I am loved and respected." Your country, you didn't. That's that's where I think. And if you understand the Mary L. Trump psychology and kind of what he does, I could see him getting to a point where it's like, "Oh, you know what? I don't even care about this job anymore. I got to go." I know it's way out there. Uh, anybody want to try? Anybody want to try uh, leaving aside the penthouse in the oh, by the Kremlin? Uh, does anybody think, Dan? Do you think that, that Trump Trump is going to accept his fate, or is he going to stir the pot in some way that's notable, um, dangerous? I mean, everything we know about him is that uh, that uh, he likes he likes the limelight, um, and that he is a pot stirrer. So I would expect if you know if his character continues to be his character, uh, he will not necessarily go quietly and not necessarily go to the sidelines. Um, whether he concedes the election if he loses, um, we will see. He, he might, but it might be grudging. But um, maybe he will. Will he? Would he attend the inauguration of the man who beat him? I don't know. Every president does it, but I don't know that President Trump would. I mean, President Trump has, you know, as we know, has constantly operated in ways that no other president in our memory operates. And so uh, trying to predict exactly what he would do if he, you know, ends up as a one-term president uh, is, you know, is, is a little bit dicey other than to, to assume that we're not going to see a dramatic change in the way he handles himself or the kinds of things he does and says. Jonathan? Evan, it's Jonathan. It's Jonathan, if I could jump in. Yes, um, please. Uh, given what we've seen over the last four years, uh, a president who for the life of him can never admit a mistake, um, it never admit he's at fault for anything, um, I wouldn't be surprised if he did not concede, 
I would not be surprised if he did not go to the inauguration. I wouldn't be surprised if he left Washington early. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if whatever he were to say that would signal that he accepted, accepted the results would be filled with grievance going all the way back to 2016 and continuing to falsely claim that, quote unquote, they spied on my campaign, my inauguration size in 2016 was bigger, all of those things um, on the way out the door and to spin it that he's happy to have his life back, happy to go back to his beautiful homes and his beautiful life before he had to deal with being president of the United States. So with, with President Trump, you know, anything is possible, but whatever he does will be utterly predictable. Evan, can I just add one more, one more uh, grace note to this? And that is um, uh, earlier this week, um, I came across the concession speech that Al Gore gave the night that he lost the presidency in 2000. Um, and uh, looking at it in retrospect, and given the times we are in and, and the condition of the country today, um, it was a remarkable speech. It runs about four or five minutes. Um, he could not have been more gracious at a time when we know he was in deep pain over having lost that, that race to President uh, Bush. Um, and it, it, is, it is a kind of a model of, of what uh, people expect uh, in moments like this, but um, we'll see to the extent to which the loser of this campaign uh, measures up to that. Alice? Yeah, I, I, I would say we know that uh, Donald Trump loves to find boogeymen wherever he, they can be, whether they're real or imagined. And he loves to see uh, um, problems and him be the solution to it. And look, when he did his final barnstorming tour of, amongst tens of thousands of adoring fans, I was glad that he did it because uh, I think he really did um, need to go and shore up some votes and remind people of the economy and the successes that he had. But he feeds off of that. And if you notice his latest boogeyman uh, over the last couple of weeks, it's been Fox News. And he had repeatedly said this would not have happened if Roger Ailes was still around. I would not be surprised if he creates his, uh, his own um, version of Roger Ailes and himself, and he and the family create their own version of, of Fox News, a conservative media outlet. They certainly now have the data uh, to support an online unit for that. So it, this would be a way for him to continue to use his voice, engage with his adoring crowd, and create um, opportunities for the Trump family to rise up in the the, the Trump media mega empire. Um, so that's something that has uh, occurred to me over the last uh, several months in terms of what is next for him, because he has gone out of his way to find um, criticism with Fox, especially after their um, airing, uh, call of Arizona. So I, I see him may want to bow out of politics and become the next Roger Ailes, but that's just me. Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the ra The election was a little closer than the pollsters said it would be. Uh, I, I, Dan, why don't you take a crack at this? What happened here on the polls? They were a li little, at least a little bit off, maybe a lot off. Yeah, they are a little bit off. I think there's going to be a, 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 as much or more soul searching after this one as uh, the last election. Certainly the national polls appear to be off. Now, there's a, there's a lot of vote yet to come in. We know that California counts slow, uh, and so the the numbers for Biden will continue to rise. It's now about a four point three point race uh, that could get up to five, but the national polls were in the neighborhood of seven or eight or nine, um, and I think people were prepared for a different outcome. Um, there were some there were many many more state polls this time than in the past, which was was a good thing, and it was an effort on the part of many organizations to, you know, to actually fill in what was a weak spot in uh, 2016. Um, and we, we were among them. We and ABC teamed up to do a lot of state polls and, and others did too. So there was a, there was a plethora of state polls. Um, you know, the, the reality is they were off in some ways, but they were not off as much as people might 
be thinking right now. And I say that because um, the three northern states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, all were in, uh, in, in leaning toward Biden in the range of five, six, seven points. Um, those states turned out to be closer, but nonetheless, uh, two of them have been called for Biden, and we'll see what happens in Pennsylvania. The, there were a lot of other states that's, that were in play, uh, and the polls showed them to be competitive, um, whether it was Florida, North Carolina, Arizona, Georgia, and then even, you know, kind of remarkably, Texas seemed to be in play based on the polls. Uh, Ohio seemed to be in play based on the polls. Iowa seemed to be in play. Um, those last three did not come through at all. I mean, Trump Trump ended up winning all of them relatively comfortably, although his margin in Texas is the lowest that any Republican has gotten in, in, in decades. So uh, something has been happening in, in Texas. But the other states are the states we're talking about right now uh, that are that are, with the exception of Florida, are generally not called yet. Uh, those look to be toss-up states going into the election, and they have turned out to be toss-up states. I think for a lot of Democrats, their sense was, well, these polls look so good in so many places, this could be an enormous blue wave. Um, and that that has not materialized in the way that I think Democrats thought. So it's a, it's a combination of some polling being off uh, and expectations being driven by some of that polling and, and getting out of hand. But the problem is, is that now we have just, I mean, I was really, I was very tempered. 2016, I, I, people thought I was crazy when I said, no, I think that Donald Trump can win. They, they really thought, no, this is impossible. So I mean, I, I, I that was, I, I was sure that that could happen. And I was convinced that I was not gonna let myself fall for what happened in 2016 again. But there was, uh, there were just an abundance of these polls that were both statewide and national. So I think the bigger question is, how do we as journalists recoup some of the cred in terms of the polling? Because it is very, it is something that we count on. Um, and, and yet at the same time, it feels, I think for, for just your regular viewer, watcher, consumer, it feels very slippery now. And so that's something else that we're gonna have to try to repair along with the presidential debate commission and the presidential debates, there were several things that suffered cracks that we've all been a witness to. And this is another one that will probably need to be repaired. Jonathan, do you have a, a view on what went wrong with the polls? When Jonathan? it comes to the polls, I was one of those, one of those people who, um, didn't put too much stock into them, maybe because of my 2016 uh, PTSD. Also, like Maria, um, understanding that the possibility of President Trump winning re-election was 50-50, uh, um, that he indeed could win re-election. Uh, also, knowing and observing what this country has been through over the last four years and what a lot of his supporters um, would countenance, would put up with, would support. Um, I didn't take it for granted that this was an election that President Trump um, would lose. So even though the polls, national polls and even state polls seem to be stable, the only poll I cared about was election day and the votes that would be counted from early, early votes, mail-in votes and, and absentee, absentee votes. Alice, do you have a thought yeah. on polling? Yeah, just in 2016, the polling was actually uh, rather accurate, accurate in terms of they had Hillary Clinton winning by about three or four percentage points and, and she did, but that was the popular vote and they didn't take enough uh, into consideration with regard to the electoral college um, part of the presidential race. And that's where the, the big problem was. I, I do think a lot of the pollsters and the media uh, recognized that uh, during uh, this time and focused more on the battleground states, which was uh, imperative to do so. Uh, but they failed to consider the turtle effect of Trump voters or the uh, became the shy turtle Trump voter and that they they don't go around 
they don't like pollsters. They don't trust pollsters. They don't trust the media. They don't put a bumper sticker on their car. They don't put a yard sign in their yard saying they support Trump. They don't tell their friends or their neighbors because they are, they're ostracized for their support of Trump. And um, they don't talk about it and they don't talk to pollsters. So there's a lot of that that these people just, just don't uh, recognize it. And it happens a lot in the work environment and in educational environments. And this is what, what I hear um, quite often. And e even in my own neighborhood, it, it's the same. There's Biden's signs all up and down the street, but the Trump supporters, we, we just don't do it. Um, and I, I think that's a lot of what's the missing factor in a lot of the polling data is that Trump supporters just keep their mouth shut and go to the polls. And that's something that needs to be taken into consideration. And, and there's also a, a, a mindset, and um, it's been discussed in the last 24 hours, that pollsters need to listen to the people and not put their own um, editorial room spin on the crosstabs of these polls and just put out the information as it comes and, and not editorialize what they're getting out of these polls. Because the election poll data was much more indicative of the mindset of the people. And that was that the economy was top of mind, followed by race relations. And then a sharp third was, was COVID. And that's certainly not how a lot of the narratives were discussed over the last 24 or 12 months or so. So it looks like it's still not absolutely clear, but it looks like uh, the Republicans will still have control of the Senate. I know there's, a, there's still a scenario that would have a 50-50. But assuming that the Republicans have control of the Senate, what does that mean for Biden and, and uh, his agenda? Dan, you want to take that first? Uh, sure. Um, well, it means a lot of difficulty for him. And I think it means a lot of you know, recalibration of what they might have been anticipating. I think that um, I think Democrats were relatively confident that they were going to get the Senate um, and that that would give them uh, maneuvering room on a Biden agenda. Um, but if, you know, if Mitch McConnell is still the Senate majority leader, uh, then Biden's going to either have to figure out a way to deal constructively with him or, or try to figure out how to get around him. But that, that won't be easy. So I, I think it, it, it means we conceivably are heading into, uh, you know, just another period of gridlock. Part of that will depend on what Senator McConnell does if he, you know, if if he is the majority leader, which we would assume, um, and how he, you know, how, how how he decides to approach Biden. I mean, they do have a relationship from, you know, from years when they both served together, and also when Biden was vice president, he was often uh, the designated person uh, to go up to the hill and try to work out some deals. But um, but overall, McConnell was implacable in his opposition to uh, the Obama agenda. And I would expect that that is probably the, the way he will start out uh, uh, in a in a Biden presidency, if there is one. So I, I think it. I mean, I think it requires a you know it will require a great deal of skill on the part of the of President Biden, if there is one, to to figure out how he's going to deal with a Senate and what that means to his ambitions on a whole series of issues. And one of those issues which, which finally came up, um, finally, finally in the last presidential debate was immigration. Um, and I just, you know, the thought of having to have yet another executive order because there will not be any legislation that will be, um, you know, sufficiently uh, comprehensive. You've got so many issues that are facing, and at this point, this country does not have a problem with immigration at all. It's down to zero. Refugees are down to a, a, a trickle, what, 10, 15,000. What this country has is a human rights problem where you have people, women who are being sterilized and children whose parents can't be found by a government that can send, uh, you know, men and women to the moon. So you have an inter international human rights crisis uh, on an incoming president's hands. And the thought that you're going to have no possibility for legislative relief on this is just you know, it, it's just hard to fathom, but that is that is very much a possibility. If, if, the, if assuming it, it is President Biden, if President Biden wants to have one thing that he can try to get done with a Republican Senate, what would that be? Jonathan, what would be, if you were President Biden and you were trying to figure out, and, and, and Mitch McConnell was still a majority leader, what would be the one thing that you would go for right away, big thing that you would go for? 
I would go for for COVID relief, um, something that would get um, money into the pockets of workers and families, um, money that would would help struggling parts of the economy, um, and also money to help out states and localities. I mean, the fact that you know the federal government doesn't have to balance its budget. And yet states and localities have to by law. And the idea that, you know, there's no, na uh, right now, there's no national plan to, to stem the pandemic in the United States. And then all of the, the after effects of that, the impact on the economy that we've been living through since March and that people are, gonna, are, are continuing to live through because no agreement can be reached between this White House um, and at this point, the, the Speaker of the House. And so I would hope that a Biden, a President Biden would be able to go to his former colleague, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, and say, look, the election is over once we get to inauguration. If you can't get something before, let's get something done. The American people are hurting. Alice? Yeah. I think that I think every member of Congress can can recognize that COVID is a nonpartisan issue and COVID relief is a paramount issue that they need to address. And there's really no reason why uh, they couldn't um, come to an agreement on uh, an acceptable number that would uh, satisfy the Democrats and what they wanted and not be too much heartburn for Republicans that are trying not to spend too much money, but that would be a, a not not just a, um, easy, but that would be a win for everyone. And I, I do think that J um, Joe Biden's demeanor is to um, m be more uh, willing to not take the credit for everything and say, "Look what we did together." Um, but uh, second to that, um, uh, you know, obviously healthcare is imperative, and you know. Republicans have promised to repeal and replace Obamacare for, for 10 years and uh, it hasn't happened. And I think in the last debate, we, we heard him talk about um, some aspects of, of tweaking Obamacare with potentially Biden care. And, you know, I think the American people don't care whose name is on it, but they, they do want health care that's quality and affordable. And I think that's while it, COVID, the relief that Jonathan mentioned, the money in the pockets of these people is 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 top priority uh but tying that in um secondly with health care is uh, is a something that needs to be done and it should be something that they can all work together on let me ask all of you how you think the world would react to a, a biden victory if that's what it's going to be how how and how it's going to affect our relations with the rest of the world what's going to be different if by if it's president biden uh, uh Maria, you go first. How, how's that? How do you think the world's going? Wow. I mean, I, 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 I <laughs> that's just like wow. That's a because I really, I'm so consumed with mathematics right now, and you know which, which media entity has said you know has which number in terms of the electoral college. So I'm not even thinking about the rest of the world. So I'm just like wow. I mean, I think the rest of the world is in a bit of a state of shock regarding the United States of America. Um, you know. Are they going to be relieved? Are they going to be if they're shocked by shocked by? I think there's I think there's going to be a recuperation period. I mean, I I think that you that you re, we cannot this doesn't just all change, you know, on January twentieth. Like there has been there is a wave a ripple effect of um, of what's happened here, and so I don't think it's just like oh my god, sh woo, it's all over. Okay, let's get and no, I mean this is going to be. Again, a tremendous amount of rebuilding, um, you know, the issue of trust uh, that, you know, I mean, that's the only thing when you're in, in international politics, the only thing that you have really, because we all watch Madam Secretary, is your word, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. how, you know, it's your word. It's how you manage. So that has got to be that, that you know, um, you know, going back to the Secretary of State of Hillary Clinton days where there was like it was all about that kind of you know, pressing flesh, this is going to take a lot of work. So um, again, healing, rebuilding, and I would hope potentially, um, 
you know, a re kind of rejiggering of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world in a place that is honestly more equal and less in a position of that. That may be one of the lasting situations is that the United States is no longer able to kind of lecture about things because we have all seen and lived through what we've just lived through. Uh, Evan, Evan, I, I, uh, yeah. Yeah. Evan uh, John, uh, John. yeah, so um, I think the word I wrote down as you asked the question initially, the world would feel relief. Um, I talked with uh, a member of the Senate, a member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee um, who told me, you know, is because I asked him, you travel around the world, you talk to um, your counterparts around the world, foreign ministers, prime ministers, presidents of, of other countries, what are you hearing from them um, in terms of their, their hopes and fears of this upcoming election? And the response he, he got back um, overwhelmingly is, we hope the Americans get it right this time that um, one uh, um, a foreign official said to him, you know, we can tread water for four years while the United States goes through this, but we can't for eight. And so I think um, if slash when Joe Biden is declared the president-elect, there will be a collective sigh of relief around the world, most definitely from, from our allies and the Western Alliance, um, certainly the Baltic states that are, you know, the first line of defense against, um, you know, whatever Russia might want to do. Um, hopefully a return to quote unquote normalcy in the relationship between the United States and and the European allies. Um, I think there's a lot of heartburn, uh, particularly in Europe, um, but I would also think in, over in Asia, South Korea, Japan, about the, about the American president, not only you know, coddling uh, strong men and dictators, but also turning his back on America's primary role for the last 70 years, and that is maintaining the, the Western Alliance, but also being the beacon and stalwart champion of small d democratic ideals, of standing up for freedom of the press and standing up for, for the, the people's right to have their voices heard by their, by their governments and standing up for the rights of those people to hold their governments accountable. That has, the United States has been missing missing an action in that. And so a, by, a, a Biden presidency would be an opportunity to repair the relationship um, and to put things back on track, uh, at least try to, the way they were before Trump became president. Alice? Evan, yeah, I spoke with a group of Latin American political leaders um, yesterday, and it, they their first um, you know, one of the questions they had um, was, you know, the difference between what did I think the difference between Trump and and Biden would be? And you know, my position on on Trump is he truly believes in his America first um, philosophy and peace through strength. Uh, but he, his mindset of being strong man and a bull in a china shop, pardon the pun, uh, was certainly um, not the best in terms of diplomatic relations. And these Latin American leaders felt as though the way he treated our allies and the way he um, treated our NATO members and pony up or, or shut up mentality um, didn't sit well with people across the country and or the world, but more concerning to them was what he has done over the last few weeks with regard to uh, questioning the integrity of our uh, elections. And and even them, these people in Latin American countries were saying, this is what we do here. You know, this is what our dictators do here. We don't expect that kind of thing in America. And it's disheartening um, to hear those kind of things from countries that ha have really seen dictators in action and this is the kind of impression they're getting out of america which is which is un unfortunate 
But um, I what, and what they said following up with Joe Biden is that he understands the, the need for uh, diplomacy and he has walked um, in, uh, she mentioned uh, Hillary Clinton, he understands diplomacy, bilateral, bilateral communications, bilateral agreements and getting things done. And, and yes, um, America, the greater America is, the greater the world is, but that doesn't mean you have to go around um, trying to intimidate people, especially our allies. And there is the sense amongst them that um, Joe Biden understands the delicate dance of diplomacy uh, much better than Trump. So Dan, how do you think Biden will demonstrate that? In well, in Evan, first couple of months? I, I think he will do everything he can to, to, to make good on what he has said when he's gone abroad over the last couple of years uh, to say America's back. Um, we will we will re-engage with the world in the way you would like us to re-engage with the world. Um, he's a familiar figure uh, around the world. Um, I, I agree with what others have said that that there will be a um, you know as Jonathan put it a sigh of relief on the part of many of our Western allies. Um, but I think that uh, the the idea that you can kind of go back to the pre-Trump era. Uh, is probably overstated, and I say that for a, a couple of reasons. Uh, one is we do not know what the ultimate impact of the pandemic is going to be kind of on, glo on, on global affairs. Um, Mike Levitt, who's the former uh, governor of Utah and was a secretary of HHS and, and, and thinks uh, deeply about the role of government, uh, I talked to him, this was a couple of months ago, and he said, from his study of pandemics, he said, the one thing I know about a pandemic is that it changes the world. He said, we don't know in what ways, but it does change the world. Um, I, I think one element of the pandemic uh, is that it probably does reinforce nationalism uh, in all kinds of places. I mean, people are worried about their own country more than they're worried about the rest of the world. We want to we want to protect our own people. And I think that that is an instinct uh, that may have some lasting effects. I think also, um, as as disruptive as President Trump has been, he has asked some very difficult questions that probably needed to be asked. I'm not sure he's provided the answers, but one big one is what should the relationship between the United States and China actually be? I mean, I think we have seen a sea change in the way um, you know elected leaders and and foreign policy you know career people. Uh, look and think about China today than they did five years ago. Um, you know, under Xi, this is a, this is a, this is a, this is a tougher regime. Uh, it is not moving toward democracy in the way that people thought that a freer economy in China would lead to a to more democratic governance. Um, Biden's going to have to figure out where he wants to be on those issues. He's going to have to figure out where he wants to be on trade. He's going to have to figure out what he wants to do vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Vladimir Putin and Russia. So these are all unanswered questions. I mean, it's it's easy to sort of say uh, we're back and we're going to re-engage, but he's re-engaging with a different world than the one he left when uh, when he departed the vice presidency. I hate to uh, look forward to 2024. But let me ask, do you think that uh, Trumpism is broadly defined? Trump or Trump, Trump or Trumpism, are, are they going to come back in 2024? Are we, we going to, is Trump himself, there's a talk about it, I guess he's talked about running again. What, what's the legacy? Could it, could it come, could he come back and could it, whatever it is, come back? Uh, I mean, I Jonathan, think, do you have a thought? Or Alice, Alice, why don't you take that? Yeah, Trumpism only works for Trump, right? Uh, Anyone else that went into a Republican primary and um, lambasted everybody up on the stage like he did wouldn't last like he like he did. But he got away with a lot because he was uh, the reality TV star, right? Uh, I don't see anyone else being able to get away with what he got away with. I don't see him wanting to run again. I know that's a lot of talk and conversation, but uh, he is um, wanting to make the next um cabillion dollars i'm sure but i don't i don't see him running again because he's going, whether he will admit it in public or not he if he doesn't win uh he's not going to want to re-enter an arena that he has lost in i i don't see that happening so um no one else can come out and 
and fill the Trumpism shoes like him. They can try, but Marco Rubio tried and um, that didn't last very long for him. So uh, if it, one thing that often get, gets asked, especially when I'm traveling abroad is, is this the new way of American politics that always going to be like this? Um, I don't think so. Uh, I don't expect it to be, but you know, this is part of the course correction, that, the change that American politics cycles go through. But um, I, I think we'll see a softer, gentler politics moving forward. Knock on wood. <laughs> yeah. Jonathan, do you agree with that? Um, uh, yeah, no, <laughs> I say it like that because I'm not sure that the, uh, uh, what Alice said at the, at the end about a gentler politics. Um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll be happy to see it, but I'm not expecting it. Um, you know, Trumpism, President Trump w will go away. Maybe some of his kids will run for office. I'm not worried about that. What I'm worried about is tr is what we've been calling Trumpism, which really isn't Trumpism. President Trump was not the disease, he was the symptom. And what he did was just pull, pull the covers back from uh, a disease that this country has been plagued with since its founding. The president ran, a can ran an openly racist, xenophobic, misogynistic campaign for president in 2016, and he won. He doubled down on that in 2018 to help the Republicans maintain control of the Senate, and he succeeded because the Republicans um, added two seats to their majority in the Senate. And he tried to run, and he ran that same playbook to win re-election in 2020. And we're going to find out um, sooner rather than later um, whether that effort was successful. But from the exit polls and the other stories that I've read, he, even though he's losing the popular vote last I saw by 3.5 or 3.9 million votes, he still got more votes than he did in 2020 than he did in 2016. Um, the fact that some Senate candidates who, Republican Senate candidates, many thought were goners, such as Susan Collins of Maine, she won re-election. Uh, Ernst in Iowa won re-election. Lindsey Graham won re-election. The, the country is going to have to deal with the inconvenient truth unearthed and exposed uh, and bandied about by the sitting president of the United States. We are going to have to deal with all of these issues if we are ever to be able to truly move beyond the, the pain and the hurt of our history to really start to like live out, truly live out the ideals that are spelled out in our founding documents. And I think the fact that the, there's still far too many people who are unwilling to touch that third rail, to talk about the role of, of race and the role of xenophobia in the 16 campaign and most definitely in the 2020 campaign. Uh, it's raised an interesting question, Maria. Let me ask of you, what could President Biden or Vice President Harris say early on that would get at race and, and, and racial division? Is there something that they can say that really beyond platitudes that would really make a difference here? I don't know if there's something that you can say. I mean, again, I, I just don't want to kind of um, gloss over like everything that we've lived through. Um, I mean, I, I think apologies actually go a long way myself. I actually think that being able to say something like, you know what, what a mistake I made with the crime bill, you know, not, not just kind of say, well, you know, I was, I was young or whatever, but really try to understand. But I don't think that it's like a one thing because the amount of hurt that the country has lived through um, on the one hand, it has inspired people to come out and vote, but it inspired people who support Trump to come out and vote. So um, I think that this is this is going to take not a year, not two years. Um, you know, certainly, I think in four years, 
with I think with a Biden Harris, the vibe that they give off, yes, there it feels like there will be certainly a sense of more unity, but I don't think it's gonna be like what can we say and make this better? It's just it's not it's not that America anymore. This these young people are not gonna be like, oh, you said the right thing, we're ready to move on. And the politics of the moment, you know, um, uh, whether it's Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and the squad or, you know, it's Jamal Bowman, there are going to be people who are going to be asking this, if there is a future Biden-Harris uh, administration, they will be pushing for accountability on these issues and not looking for platitudes. They will be talking about budgetary money lines, you know, reconstruction. And in that sense, it's going to be an interesting and very dynamic conversation, but not a simple you know, although an apology, I, I again, but it's not going to be a simple one now. So, Dan, how do you think that President Biden will get along with his left, his left wing progressives? Uh, it will it will be a, 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 a bit of a fractious uh, relationship. Everybody, you know, the wide spectrum of the Democratic Party, however you define wide, uh, put those differences aside uh, for the cause of trying to defeat President Trump in this election. Um, but everybody was pretty open about the fact that, uh, you know, if Biden becomes the president, uh, they're going to reopen these issues um, and they are going to do everything they can to push him on the issues. Uh, they are going to demand to be heard. They're going to demand seats at the table. Um, I mean, one of the things we've seen within the Democratic Party over the last few years is that, that people acknowledge that the, the coalition is changing. Um, obviously, women are much more central to the Democratic coalition. Um, black Americans obviously have been for a long time, black women especially. Um, and younger people are looking for, for a, a stronger voice. Um, they're, they're no longer willing uh, to simply say, you know, we, we at least want to be heard. They want, they want some tangible evidence uh, that they have a voice. And that, that's going to be challenging to to Biden because he obviously, he ran as a different kind of, of candidate than that. Um, he's, he's made it clear during the general election, you know, I beat those guys whenever he's, you know, somebody, when Trump or anybody else has accused him of being a, you know, a socialist or being, you know, being a uh, hostage to the democratic left. Uh, I beat those guys is, is the way he's approached it. Um, but now he will have to deal with them in the same way he's going to have to deal with some Republicans if the, if the, the, Republicans uh, clearly are in control of the Senate. Um, I want to go back very briefly to the question of Trumpism. And, and um, um, I agree with Alice on this point, that, that Trump, Trump himself is Trumpism and is unique. Uh, and if you remove him, something, you know, something is missing. Um, but the, the Republican Party was undergoing a change before Trump, and I think that has accelerated under Trump, and that is that it has become much more of a, of a party of working class people, uh, and in particular, a, a party of, of people who are anti-elites. And whatever debate that unfolds um, if Trump is not reelected, and I think we should stipulate because we've gone through this hour as if, you know, this election is completely over and we should stipulate that there is still a possibility that Trump yeah. gets a second term. But nonetheless, um, if, if he's not there and there's competition in 2020 for 2024, um, that's an element of the constituency that Donald Trump has created um, that is still there and, and will be looking for somebody to speak for them and to them. And that, that is part of the legacy of Trump. I want to take some more questions from the audience. And uh, somebody, one question is, uh, what will Wall Street, is Wall, will Wall Street be happy with Biden? Anybody want to take that? No takers? <laughs> Jonathan, 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 you can work in New York. He can. Jonathan, Jonathan you know, you're in New York. Jonathan, is Wall Street going to be happy with, with uh, a Biden administration? I don't have I don't have an answer for you. Uh, I may have lived in New York, but that's as far as it goes. <laughs> okay, so I'm a New Yorker. Okay, yeah, I live yeah, in Harlem. Maria, you take let me it. Talk for, let me talk for all New Yorkers <laughs> since I live in Harlem. And you know, hey, I mean, I, look, the reason why somebody who I know and love, Mexican American banker from the Rio Grande Valley, who is a civil rights supporter in the state of Texas, but 
hated Trump, but ended up voting for him this time. And what he told me was he's been great for my retirement and my head exploded. So I just, I, we know that people have made a lot of money during this time of the pandemic. I can't, you know, I can't wrap my head around it, but we know that we know that the stock market is inching its way back up. Of course, we took a huge hit. What I don't understand about the question of, of Wall Streeters is, isn't it easier to make more money when things are less volatile? But then I forget that actually at the core of capitalism is a tremendous sense of volatility. And that, you know, some of the biggest winners in capitalism thrive off of that volatility and make money off of that volatility. So that's spoken as a real New Yorker, which means I don't really know about Wall Street, but thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> it was a pretty good one, huh? <laughs> yeah. Alice, do you have a guess? What, yeah, how, I, how the business community in Wall Street's going to Yes, react? so much of, of what we heard um, Joe Biden say on the campaign trail was uh, he's for Main Street and Donald Trump's for Wall Street and Park Avenue, um, and that the tax cuts that um, Trump impo or implemented uh, benefited um, the wealthy and the the rich people and the business owners. And without Trump there and the tax policies that Biden will put in will benefit middle America. So, you know, the, just based on um, the conversation and the, the dialogue out there on the campaign trail, um, middle America will be happy with Joe Biden, according to him, and Wall Street will panic because his policies are, are not beneficial to the higher income. But but the but the reality is, I, I think if if Wall Street does well, if businesses are thriving and the economy is going well, that's beneficial certainly to Wall Street, but to, to everyone. So I would like to think that um, we could stop looking at things that what's beneficial to Wall Street over Main Street, and that we're all if every if one side of the coin benefits, it sh it should be beneficial to everyone. You know, and then there's talk. Well, th there was a lot of speculation once people thought that Biden would win, everyone was going to go sell their stock and put it under their mattress. But um, I, I I'm I'm a subscriber to the you know take a breath and uh, let things let the dust settle before you make any kind of um, stark decisions when it comes to to finances or or the impact of this election. Here's an interesting question from uh, somebody in, in our audience. Joe Biden has said he'll be a transitional president. If he wins, important to keep that if in there, if he wins, does he have a chance to become a transformational president? Dan, does he have a chance to become a tr not just a transitional, but a transformational president? What would he have to do? Well, if we get transformational presidents when they uh, you get a president that has to deal with very, very big problems. And so in, in a sense, the ingredients are there uh, for him to be a transformational president. Um, you know, the combination of the pandemic and the impact on the economy uh, is enormous. And, and these are these are huge challenges that are going to be right on his plate when he comes in. Um, the agenda that he has put forward um, is an expansive and ambitious agenda, uh, whether it's on health care or climate or and many other issues. Um, but I think that that was, you know, that runs into the reality that we've been talking about already, which is, um, can he achieve those goals um, with a Senate that is controlled by Republicans? And, and that will no doubt temper his ability to do that. But, um, you know, the 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 question about Biden, I think, in terms of transformational is uh, it requires, in addition to those ambitions, uh, uh, the, the kind of qualities of leadership that inspire and energize and mobilize an, an entire society. I think there are two questions about that. Um, as a candidate, Biden has not been the, obviously the most visionary candidate for president that we've seen. Um, and the, uh, the, the, the question of whether that will be different as president is, is hard to say, but you would say he's not going to be fundamentally different in that way. But the second is uh, to mobilize the entire country uh, under, under the circumstances by which he will be governing is going to be enormously difficult. 
there's there's nearly half the country that starts his presidency in in serious opposition to him. Uh, yes, there will be you know presumably a honeymoon, um, but we know that the country is so divided, and it's divided not just on issues but on values, and and those issues are are harder to overcome as a leader because as a leader you obviously project the values that you believe in but we know that there's two sets of values in the country right now so that's a long way of saying yes it's it's possible because of the the, the problems that he is going to have to confront and if he is successful uh we might remember him as a transformational but but uh but the obstacles in his way are are quite significant jonathan you want to take a crack at that does uh does biden what, what could he do if anything to be a transformational president you know, I, I think Dan Dan um, said it uh, perfectly and has it absolutely right. I actually um, wrote down that, you know, sure, Vice President Biden, if he becomes president, he will most definitely be a transformational president in rhetoric. The problem will be turning that rhetoric into reality. And Dan hit on exactly what I was going to hit on, and that is as long as there is a, a Senate majority that is led by Mitch McConnell, there's, I don't see what big transformational things uh, by uh, a, a President Biden could get through, the, get through the House, but also get through the Senate and onto his desk for his signature. Mitch McConnell, Senator McConnell is not going to be interested in helping a President Biden, and that's the way he's going to look at it, not helping the country that is in deep pain right now, economically and health-wise. Um, it'll sort of be like his 2000, what he said about uh, President Obama at the beginning of his term, where he said that his number one goal is to make sure, was to make sure that President Obama was a one-term president. Uh, I think given the way politics are now, that that will be his his M.O. on steroids. Hmm. There is one transformational thing that he did do, right, which is naming hmm. Kamala Harris. Um, so in that sense, absolutely, you know, there there is something there that I think um, as complicated as it is, I, I think there is something there that was transformational in that decision because it recognizes so many things that historically needed to be recognized. And so agreed on all the fronts, but there's, there's that, that possibility that already feels transformational so, in this country. Maria, what, what, what do you think that Biden should ask uh, Harris to do, or what could she do that would, that would give her a, a big role here? Often vice presidents fade into the background. I mean, she really could, try to take on the issue of healing the country. Um, again, I don't, I, I don't know how you do that, but if there was an attempt, cause you know, it's been, it's been so long since we've had these notions, but you know, if there was an attempt to try to have a national dialogue or a national movement for healing or something like that, or, you know, uh, taking her into communities, uh, you know, where it seems she does really well that, and actually that's building her up for four years from now when she'll run for president is kind of doing that deep in communities, doing listening. I mean, some people might say, well, that's very, you know, vice presidential-y, but I, I think that it's something that she could do, could do well and actually could end up being really, really important for the country. I mean, I think we're looking for leaders, we're looking for leaders, right? Who we can listen to, who we can identify with, who, um, you know, who have a sense of um, of potentially healing. And even though Kamala is complicated, she didn't give me an interview. So, you know, we're, we're already, we're still asking, but, um, you know, I, I think that that is a role that she could play. She definitely, one thing that she exudes is that warmth, that kind of casualness that, you know, back before the pandemic, like I'll hug you and it's like a real, like, I'm not afraid of you. Like I'm, I'm, I'm with you. And that is actually refreshing in a politician, especially um, it's just great that she happens to be a woman who's also black and the daughter of immigrants. I, I think what vice presidents, obviously they step up in times of, of crisis and it, if something major comes up, she can oversee and be tasked with 
a certain task force, potentially um, Biden had mentioned with regard to the Supreme Court. But uh, I think there's really so many positive qualities about Kamala Harris and um, her shining moment, I feel like out of the debates with when she told the story about I was that girl, that that was me. And here's what, you know, what I went through with regard to um, being an African-American in America. And uh, yes, she is, I think, a phenomenal person to um, heal those racial divides and bring the country together and um, do it in a way that um, is a, as a role model to to American um, girls and boys and people of all all backgrounds because she's really um, risen to a phenomenal place. And as I said, that was a really compelling moment for me when she was able to stand up to the front front runner of the party and and be so forceful, but in a compassionate way. And that's I feel like um, the best way that we can heal these racial tensions, which is a, a big issue for. Um, on people's minds. And um, the fact that she has such a personal story to tell and does it in a compelling way uh, would make it even more meaningful. Uh, here's a question. Uh, will this cycle's issues lead to changes in media coverage of future elections? Is the media going to do anything different? Uh, they, they, they've, they've, had, they've had their issues, obviously. Uh, is this going to provoke any change in how, how Dan, how the media covers elections? Um, I would hope so. I mean, this has been an odd election because of COVID and the inability of reporters to really do what they normally do. I mean, I've been, I've been, uh, I, I've not been on the road for eight months. Um, and obviously there are a lot of people who have been out, but not in the way that is the normal way. And the interaction with voters has been much more limited uh, than it should be. Um, I, Evan, we, we go through, as you well know, from your own experience, we go through a kind of, a, you know, an after action analysis of what we did well and what we didn't do well and, and what we missed. I, I think, you know, certainly throughout the entire four years of the Trump administration, we've constantly asked ourselves, do we understand this country as well as we should? Uh, and I think that, you know, after 2016, the answer was no. And I suspect that, that the answer after this election will be no, that um, that in one way or another, we are we are missing um, what is uh, driving uh, a large number of people in this country um, uh, to support somebody like President Trump. Um, and what are the what are the what are the issues that that prompt that support? What is the loyalty that he generates? Um, and and how that all adds up. Um, I mean, I've said this in the past, but Peter Hart, the pollster, said to me when I was a you know a much younger reporter, the the goal of political reporters should not be handicapping the outcome of race of a race. Um, the goal should really be to prepare people for what the outcome ultimately is, so that people have a better understanding at the time it's happened why it happened. And I think that that, you know, I think we did not do that well in 2016. Um, we may have done it a little better this time, but I'm not sure about that. People can be their own judge of it. Um, I, I would hope that um, we we become a, a little less um, focused uh, on, on polling data and probability and all of that. And I, I say that as somebody who writes most of the or co-writes most of the polling stories at the Post, but um, every every single poll gets more attention than a single poll ought to. And I think we have to somehow break ourselves of that habit. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the diversification of the political reporting uh, cadre is very good and important. Um, and I think that in addition to, you know, diversifying it by, uh, by gender and by race, uh, we have to we have to diversify it in some ways in a, in a sense regionally uh, and perhaps ideologically that we have to have we have to have reporters who understand all types of Americans. Uh, no one of us can do that individually, and so you need a team uh, to be able to do that. Anybody? Else yeah, no, I mean, I, I'm hoping. I'm certainly hoping. But I was hoping that 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 journalism would be transformed after 2016. 
because it, such a poor job had been done. I mean, for me, that's a much bigger, bigger question um, in terms of the role of, of the mainstream media, of which I am a part of, but also a critic and also somebody who is an independent journalist who now has my own nonprofit media company, right? So now I am producing and competing along with everybody else. And by the way, we're doing fine. And, and I would say our work is doing fine precisely because of what we do that is different than the mainstream media. So the work that we do at Futuro is all about, in fact, focusing on not a perspective that is majority white, male, uh, heterosexual, and of privilege. By the way, many of those white men of, are my friends. I mean, I love them, right? We work together. But there is a perspective in the world that they carry, and in fact, that they carry throughout the coverage of this entire administration. If anything, you know, this whole notion of like, oh my God, you know, Trump is like, you know, shattered, or we didn't expect this. We, I mean, really, we needed to be much more prepared. We should have been, uh, journalists should have been having conversations with journalists who have lived through authoritarian regimes with the use of propaganda, with a president that consistently lies. We needed to have, we need to have been much smarter in the entire way that we, I, I say the media writ large, approached this particular presidency. And I'm gonna say something that is, well, it's because it's us here, we're doing this, but, and, and it's probably gonna irk you several, but that's okay. That's, that's kind of, you know, I mean, in many ways, that's the role of a journalist. But I, the reason, and, and maybe you can understand why I'm saying this because of who I am, a Mexican immigrant, American citizen, woman journalist uh, from Harlem, New York City and the south side of Chicago, is that um, why did Donald Trump and his administration get a pass? Because the majority of the people who were covering him, who were reporting on him, are very similar to him. White supremacy, to use that ugly thing that at least now we talk about, and it's ugly, nobody likes to talk about it. But with all due respect, if you are a white man, you may be sickened by white supremacy, but it is not going to impact you in the way that it is going to impact me. And so how we approach the coverage of an administration and a campaign like this needs to kind of pull back and do that level of analysis. Will it happen? You know, the, the thing that has happened in the last 10 years, you know, 20 years is that more independent journalists can be part of the mix, right? So that we're inside and out, right? And that part of the conversation, because what we need is we need more journalists writ large. We need more journalists of every possible background so that our profession survives what we've just been through. That leads me to a question from the audience. Any role about any thoughts about the role of social media on this election? Yeah, I, I do. Yeah. I, I, I have I have some concerns about the what's going on with uh, Facebook and Twitter and um, picking and choosing um, indiscriminately which um, social media posts they want to fact check or say it needs to be verified. Um, social media. Um, needs to decide if they want to be a platform or a publisher. And if they're platforms, then their role is to allow people free speech and let them put up content that that they want to, to say. Obviously, we can't put up um, dangerous information, child pornography, threatening um, content, but that's the role of social media. And news outlets are publishers that are subjected to the scrutiny of making sure they are factually accurate. I think social media has been invaluable uh, for President Trump and a big key to his success is being able to use social media to communicate directly to his supporters without the, what he calls filter of, of the media. And it's, it's imperative, but with the ideology and there's no denying the ideology of the, tech giants uh, that oversee these me these social media outlets, um, they cannot have it both ways. They cannot uh, hide behind uh, the opportunity to be a, a platform for free speech and then decide what they want to fact check. So I think there needs to be some tremendous scrutiny. I don't think government should uh, control social media by any stretch of the imagination, but they, they need to, to decide 
uh, if they want to um, publish and fact check data, they need to go open up a media outlet because social media is protected uh, in order to allow for free speech. Okay, we have about five minutes left, so I'm going to take on as a last question for all four of you this broader question about the future of American democracy. A lot of talk in this election of people being worried about the future of American democracy. How should we be feeling this evening? Uh, Dan, why don't you take the first crack at that? Well, we can go back to what we talked about right in the opening, uh, Evan, and say, well, maybe we should feel pretty good about it. There, there, there was a tremendous outpouring of people who wanted to vote. Um, in the middle of a pandemic, more people figured out that they wanted to vote and figured out how to do it and do it safely. Uh, than we've ever seen before. We don't know what the ultimate number is, but it's certainly going to break the record from last time. I don't know what the ultimate uh, percentage of the turnout will be, but but it's it's been extraordinary, and and I think that that's a hopeful sign. Um, but there's aspects of our democracy that have been weakened as a result of this president, um, and there are aspects of democracy that I think um, we're we're going to have questions raised about it. Um, we are we are in a situation where the uh, one party has won the popular vote seven in the last eight elections, um, but they did not win several of those elections. Um, and that conceivably could grow. And again, if President Trump were to eke this out, that would do that would be twice in a row. Um, that that's an issue that I think people are are more concerned about that as we have this this yawning kind of urban rural divide in this country um, and the question of representation uh, that's that's something that people are going to ask about the, the future of the electoral college is something that more people want to talk about um, you know there's the, this issue of what about what about the supreme court packing the court if you know if you see it in one way expanding the court if you see it in another way but that's that's an issue all of these issues relate to the question of is our democracy uh, fairly representing the will of the people. And I think that those are issues, again, no matter who wins this election and, and uh, who wins the 22, 2022 midterms, those are issues that are now on the table that they weren't five years ago or, or certainly 10 years ago. And I think it reflects the changing nature of the country um, and, and concerns that people have that things are not working the way they should. Um, the founders did a pretty good job, basically, and, and it's held up for a long, long time. But that doesn't mean that, you know, everything is is perfect. And that's the part of the debate that I think we will have uh, in the future. Jonathan? Um, <clears throat> during the transition um, from Obama to President Obama to President Trump, uh, and there were questions about whether uh, President-elect Trump would uh, be in violation of the emoluments clause. Um, I wrote a, a, a column where I said that, you know, that transit in that transition period, I learned um, a lot about our constitution. And by that, I mean, in, in grade school, you know, we learn that our nation, our laws, our democracy are built on this granite-like structure called the Constitution. But during that transition period, it became clear as day to me that the Constitution is only as strong as the person who swears to uphold and defend it. And what we saw then and what we have seen over the last almost four years is how much damage can be done to the Constitution and to American democracy specifically and, de and democracy writ large when there's a chief executive who neither reveres nor cares about the constitution. And so to me, American democracy is in trouble. I viewed this election not just as a choice between President Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden, I've also viewed this as the nation choosing between saving American democracy or, or uh, maintaining white supremacy. And 
if Joe Biden does succeed in becoming the next president of the United States, that's not to say that white supremacy goes away or disappears and no longer becomes a pro- or is no longer a problem. But at least it gives me a glimmer of, of hope that not only did the American people choose American democracy, uh, but also cho- chose to save our system and to save our country. And that is my, my fervent hope that the damage that has been done, the great damage that has been done to our country and our constitution can start to be repaired. But it can only start to be repaired if indeed Joe Biden and Kamala Harris become the next president-elect and vice president-elect of the United States. Uh, we have just a few seconds left, but but uh, Alice, do you want to jump in on that? And uh, then Maria? Sure, I'll, I'll just um, make it brief. Again, the the numbers of people we've had, the record numbers of people coming out to vote, uh, under the current circumstances um, is uh, reassurance and um, confirmation with me that our democracy is alive and well. And um, we are certainly a great nation and we have great opportunity. And um, the fact that people came out like they did um, was phenomenal. And you can love or hate Donald Trump, but I hope we take away from this, people on both sides, no matter who comes out on top, recognizing that Donald Trump just did not just wake up one day in the White House. There's virtually half of America that voted him there. So if he's not the next president, I hope that the people who nominated the next president recognizes that there's other people, the rest of this country, half of this country does not share their ideology. And while we can embrace diversity, of race and gender and sexual orientation and religion, we need to do more as a country to embrace the diversity of ideology. And that's something that that I hope that we can do moving forward. Maria? Yeah, I just hope that that ideology does not include white supremacy, because I think that that is in fact the thing that is really just really the thing that is continual, the pressure on this country that, that takes us down. But having said that, the lesson for me is that democracy is a verb. And that's what I've been saying in all of my, democracy is a verb and it's only as good as all of us. And that's why what we did here working late, all of us are up, the people who are watching this, this is what it looks like. It looks about feeding our minds. And then ideally soon in real life, being able to talk to our neighbors and our family and engage in conversations without filled with hatred and division but actually trying to save ourselves. Those are tiny acts of democracy with a small D and hopefully with enough of that, we can save democracy with the big D. So thank you for all of this. And, and for my colleagues, um, a, a pleasure to be with you. Same with you. Maria, thank you for the thank last you. word. Thank you to all the panelists and thank you to the Kennedy Library for giving us this opportunity to talk about this great subject. Good night. Good night.